I'm Electa Tritch. We're standing at the moment in the southeast corner of Littleton, Massachusetts, part of a large area I choose to call Neshoba. I'm grateful to be joined on camera and off in the course of my explorations by two men who have spent many years studying and coming to terms with Neshoba and its inhabitants. I'll introduce you to them as we go along. In different centuries, the term Neshoba referred to larger or smaller tracts of land where a band of Nipmuc Indians made their home place. They called it Neshoba. But the colonial documents are very vague as to exactly where they lived within this home place. Unlike compact Wampanoag and Massachusetts communities located in the fertile coastal plain and rich in resources, Nipmuc communities in this interior part of Massachusetts tended to be small and spread out. Each wigwam located to take best advantage of sparse resources. So to get a halfway appropriate idea of Neshoba territory, you first have to stop thinking like a European. Imagine instead a circle closely surrounding your home place. Stretch it out to include the wigwams of your neighbors and the food and water sources close by. And then stretch it even further to reach key features of your shared clan life. The place to gather reeds in summer, to harvest nuts come fall, the great stone turtle effigies, and the hilltop where the earth's voice thunders. Farther still, concentric rings of trade and tribal loyalty stretch till they intersect with other people's home places, either in peace or war. The Neshoba home territory likely stretched from Long Pond in the north, southwest to Fort Pond, and then eastward to Nagog Pond three large natural water bodies. As John Eliot first translated, Nashoba means land between the waters. Today, this area is crisscrossed by trails on land managed by the Littleton Conservation Trust, by the town of Littleton, and by landowners who give us permission to explore. Sarah Dublet Forest is the youngest of these conserved properties. Leading our way today are Neshoba scholar Dan Boudillon and his daughter Caitlin. If you enter Sarah Dublet Forest near the caretaker's house off Charter Way, what you'll find first is quite a flat, even looking piece of ground scrub juniper and hidden among some new cedar trees the chimney that is what's left of a house. Two nurses retired here to farm, eventually giving all their property to the Littleton Conservation Trust. The exposed soil and the mossy ground cover are a testament to the poverty and shallowness of what's up here. It's not farmland to speak of. The other thing that characterizes this landscape, which we'll see a lot more of as we continue walking, are rocks. Lots of rocks. Big rocks. A mind with a bent toward fantasy can make many things of. Beyond the house, but near it, is an open space. There's a little bit of low bush blueberry, more of that moss, and a series of mounds that suggest something was once planted here, hilled up around. Some people want to believe that it's corn, and it may date back to the times when the Nipmuc lived here. The somewhat obscure woodland trails are still consistently marked, and in fact, one of the clearest of them is actually an AT&T right of way. These stones do not all resemble the basic field stones you expect to find in this part of the world. Many of them are much flatter, almost as if they have been split in a certain way they have been. 
Those nice flat stones were once part of layered granite. The top of this hill is astonishingly flat, almost as if it has been smoothed or sanded down. The Ed Bell Trail hugs the edge of this plateau, carefully protected by a massive stone wall that marches even closer to the edge. At the east edge of this plateau, the rocks tumble 70 feet precipitously down a hillside to the shore of Nagog Pond. This has been a special place for eons, or at least centuries. And part of what has made it so special is the layering caused by the shifting of the granite plains disturbed by glacial action and by the occasional earthquake that is one of the anomalies for which Littleton is famous. This granite is a, an island in the middle of a landscape that is underlaid by a much less solid stone called schist. Okay, there's Nagog Pond, there's Fort Pond, and we're here. And this is the Sarah Doublet Forest. The Andover granite is like an island. Hmm. And virtually all of, well, all the Sarah Doublet Forest and virtually all of the 500-acre reservation, and this was the center of the village, is up here on the Andover Granite. Winter is a good time to walk in the woods if you're trying to understand what the woods look like. The rocks show up. You can see through the bare tree trunks into the distance and down. The broad expanse of Nagog Pond showing clearly through the leafless trees. But there's more to this area's attraction than just woods and rocks. But one of the things you have to know is that, that this place, Neshoba, is uh, known as Neshoba. It means place between the waters. And there's also a deeper meaning to it that Eliot, the apostle to the Indians back in the 1650s had. And in his interpretation of the native language when he put the Bible into Algonquin is that it means of the spirit. So this is a place that, in his interpretation of the native language, was that this is the place in the midst of spirit. This place in the midst of spirit includes unexpected surprises on the downslope side of the ledge. The shelter that these ledges provide give rise to continue respect from those who leave gifts to the spirit that still remains on this hillside a piece of quartz inside the cave, an offering from some more recent meditation, supports Dan's comment that this is still a sacred place to many people. What intrigues me about this site is that I believe this area to be a sacred area, and it looks like other people of other traditions have found a, a similar resonance here, uh, Wiccans being for one, and I've also seen the Tibetan monks up here uh, meditating as well. Hmm. Clamoring down the hill from the ridge at the top, we see in the distance Nagog Pond, and we're here looking for something rather unusual, a turtle effigy. But we'll let Dan talk about that when we find it. Finally, almost at the bottom, where the wetlands begin despite the road going by, and the hill begins to climb toward the grand ridge at the top is the turtle. Well, when I look at this, I see the profile of a turtle. I see its back shell, big back shell. I see off to the far right, the head of the turtle looks like a little beak there of a snapping turtle. And that's interesting because in the Merrimack Valley, the, uh, the snapping turtle in particular was sacred to the uh, Native Americans. In fact, in many Native American belief systems and throughout the world. Turtle, respected for longevity and patience. Turtle, who brought mud up from an endless watery void so the Creator Spirit could make Earth. Turtle as mother, the creature who carries the world on its back. From this angle, he looks like nothing so much as a bunch of rock. But from a different view, and with a dash of imagination, 
This is the mama turtle making her way back up the hill to her home from the shore of Nagog Pond, where she has lain her eggs and will produce her heirs. Now that you see her, she could have her head stuck out, turned to the side, looking back toward the pond from whence she probably came herself. Looking for green on an early spring day is always a satisfying action. There is, of course, the green of the moss on the rocks. Some sheep laurel struggling to look green through the winter. Closer, though, you see the green of the indomitable catbriar that in the deepest woods still seems to appear. And then beyond, winter green. Pick a piece, break it in half, and smell the wonderful spicy scent that evokes summer and sun even in the beginning of March. There's Princess Pine, and the farther you look, the more you'll see scattered over the landscape, little tufts of green sticking up through the oak leaves. Beyond the Princess Pine are the nearly hidden leaves of partridge berry. It's berries long gone having been found by all the small creatures that hide nearby. Of course, there are different colors and critters in other seasons. And the person who calls them forth best, to my mind, is John Mitchell, writer, naturalist, longtime Little Tonian. John has what I think of as a magical ability to contemplate nature and culture at the same time. We were talking about your becoming interested in Sarah's story, um, but I was thinking as you were saying that, how whether this landscape looked different when she was here. The lay of the land, the actual structure of the land here is, I don't know, 12,000 years old, mm -hmm. at least. Um, Geological time. Geologic time, right. yeah. To, well, Sarah, to you know, the latest ice age. Well, see, Sarah's that, people, though, would have been here. Uh, paleo people 12,000 years ago would appreciate a hill like this where we are. Because why? They, because yeah. they looked down over the flatlands or the lowlands and they could see the herds of um, barren ground caribou and. Uh, Hmm. maybe a, a mastodon and, uh, or two, and um, you know, the wild game that was passing through and plot their hunt. Mm -hmm. It's interesting then if you move forward a few thousand years uh, to the more agrarian time before the Anglos came to this country, um, not a hill like this particularly, mm. which as we've seen is pretty barren on the top. Mm -hmm. But um, certainly the long slopes near, uh, the gentle slopes near Long Pond mm -hmm. uh, and the marshy areas around all of the ponds that they frequented mm. would have a wonderful range of food sources. Right. Native American farms are only about 3,000 years old. Mm -hmm. and, uh, the, the, but then when you think of the yeah. Anglo-American farms being only about 300 years yeah, old, exactly. that's, yeah, yeah. that's a long time. Yeah, yeah. More specifically here, yeah. the Nipmuc. The Nipmucs, and, or, or the Massachusetts, well, or the yeah. Pentecost, or, you know, I know, I know. It's a, this yeah. area in Littleton is sort of a, a, a meeting place mm. of three right. different yeah. uh, recent Native American yeah. tribal Eastern, they were cultures. Algonquian speaking yeah. Eastern woodland culture. Right. It's a, it's a deep history and you know we tend to overlook it and think that ours is you know the beginning of time. Well, <laughs> land here is filled with legends and, well, uh, and mysteries stories. and ghosts. And filled with stories. And all that. Yeah. And, yeah. And every culture <laughs> has its own stories. That's right. Of That's right. the same place. Yeah. So. Which is why it's so interesting that you're talking about Sarah. She was the daughter, I think, of Tahatawan, mm -hmm. who was the conquered, right. sachem of Concord. 
but Tahatawan was also the one who chose this area That's of right. Neshoba yeah. as his preferred place for a so-called praying Indian village. Yeah. Um, um, they're buried. And, and I found something really interesting about that. Uh, I looked up the record of his doing that because there had been some comment made by somebody I talked to that uh, Tahatawan had said that this was the place that had spirit or whatever. However, what the record says, now remember this is an English record, what the record says is that he said in appropriately subservient way, he said <laughs> that he wanted to be closer to Concord um, because he was afraid that he and his clan might um, stray from the ways of God if he were put out there farther in the wilderness, which is mm. where the Concordians and the general court really wanted them to be out yeah. of the way. Yeah. And so he sort of dug his heels in and said, no, this is, this is where I want to be. Yeah. You know, having basically a suburban upbringing, there, there's a certain challenge for me coming into this area, these woods, and not being sure that I'm going to be lost for months at a time, especially not being on a trail. Mm -hmm. it's, it's hard to find your way around when you're not used to it. Yeah, yeah. well, Sarah, Sarah Dublin was never lost here. This, mm. this was um, as common to her as your backyard. Sarah Dublett knew this territory well. She knew the trees, probably even the same species of trees that I know, save for the few that are missing, such as the chestnut. As a skilled gatherer, she would have known most of the plants in this 500-acre tract, would have known where the best berry patches were, would have known where the ground nuts could be gathered and where the little hog peanuts grew. She would have known the sweet flag and the best spots to gather rushes and reeds for mat making. She was never lost here. She knew the lay of the land, the slopes, the hillocks, the streams, the ponds, the cry of the seabirds that settle on Magog Pond in autumn before the ice comes in. She knew salamanders and the wood frogs that still drift, legs outspread in the little temporary ponds here in spring. She would have known the songs of all the birds, the song sparrow, the white throat in autumn, the trills of juncos in winter, and no doubt she had heard from her grandmother stories for each. That's how she made that connection. So it's critical. Stories are critical. The end of Sarah Dublett's story and that of the Nipmuc settlement in Neshoba is fairly well documented. When the Massachusetts General Court decided in 1714 to legislate a colonial settlement in the area that had been Neshoba, they carefully set aside land by Nagog Pond. And that 500 acres of land be reserved and laid out for ye benefit of any of ye descendants of ye Indian proprietors of ye said plantation that may be surviving, a portion whereof to be for Sarah Dublet alias Sarah Indian. The townspeople called the reservation New Town. Twenty years later, Sarah deeded away the last of her land already surrounded by the new Anglo settlement of Littleton. New Town disappeared at that point, and Sarah Dublett was known as the last praying Indian. That doesn't mean she was the last Indian. But the delicate arrangement the Nipmuc had sustained for unknown generations with that place called Neshoba was symbolically voided when she signed her deed of sale. Little by little, the general area was divided and quartered until by 1830, there was not a yard of it, not so much as a foot that had not been measured and walked over and argued over. Eternal discussion over who owns what and where, which line runs to which rock wall and, and where this or that town line runs and why. The wild open country of the Paleo Indians had become a nation of quiet yeomen with an enduring capacity for work. That capacity and necessity shows up all around the Neshoba woodlands, in the stone walls and the stone-free clearings, 
the prolific orchards and remnant fields that have not yet given way to housing developments. Follow any trail through this area and look for signs of history. Even most of the trails themselves are not new. Moving north and west from Sarah Doublet Forest, we enter the Neshoba Woodlands Conservation Area. Seven contiguous parcels, protected by the Littleton Conservation Trust and by the town. It's a beautiful area of woods. Uh, it is full of beech trees, which suggests that it's somewhat sweeter soil here than over at Sarah Doublet. And uh, this time of year in the spring, it has everything to say for it. My invisible guide to this part of the trip is Art Lazarus, a longtime Littleton Conservation Trust supporter and writer of the invaluable guide to the conservation lands here in town. Great maps, wonderful information on the flora and fauna, warnings about poison ivy, and also the information about the geological wonders here that I don't know myself. In spring, some of the lowlands, the kettles left by the glaciers, are undoubtedly vernal pools. A seasonal brook lined with skunk cabbage and ferns defines the drainage and flows under a boardwalk meander. There's enough stone in these woods to sometimes make it difficult to distinguish between glacial erratic boulders, ledge, or stone walls. Ahead of us is a real stone wall. But beyond the stone wall is a much more impressive geological phenomenon, Fort Rock. It may not look very fortress-like from here, but when we get up closer, you'll see why it was called that. It's looking bigger. The rock has been split in four or five different places, right through the middle. A sizable tree seems to have taken advantage of the opportunity. In every direction, you can see the paths leading up to here. But the view from here might well be from the ramparts of a woodland fort. Certainly there are enough geological abnormalities here, but I'm not seeing those neat layered uh, ledges of rock that we saw at Sarah Doublet. Obviously Fort Rock is a huge glacial erratic, and so there's lots of good granite here, or granodiorite, um, but there are also things like under here, wonderful sl layers, slabs of quartz that are not unusual to find with granite, but certainly in this quantity isn't something you see often. Clearly there are other minerals here too, but believe me, I'm not an expert. So luckily I brought along my trusty guide to conservation land in Littleton that Art Lazarus wrote. Let me read. It says, most of the rock here in this particular area is hard gray granite pegmatite, consisting of large, nicely formed feldspar and quartz crystals with books of black sheet mica. That's a wonderful phrase. Let's see if we can find some books of mica. The quartz is everywhere. You can't miss it. Some of it is pure white, like milk. Some of it is translucent. More difficult to find is that booked mica that Mr. Lazarus referred to. And here it is. Once you find it, it's hard to miss. Every little black spot on this rock is a piece of mica. It's just kind of sandwiched in there among the other minerals on this boulder. And it's just beautiful when the sun catches it. So I'm standing here with rocks that have been estimated to be 400 million years old. That's venerable even in Earth time. What surprises me most though 
with the megalithic scale of things here and the broad views it has to offer is that there does not seem to have been or be any particular spiritual resonance here the way there is at Sarah Doublet. Be that as it may, I can tell you this is a very powerful place. There's one more parcel of Neshoba to visit. From a parking spot off Harwood Road, find the row of pines and follow them down an old wood road and a long sloped path to the shoreline of Long Lake. This was a place that spoke to Nipmuc and Anglo alike. A gentle slope down to a fish-filled pond, decent soil, good exposure, and wildlife flocking to the marsh nearby. Over time, there were campsites, later pastures, now remembered by their stone walls, and apple orchards, remembered by the feral apple trees found all over town. Today, more than 1,800 feet of Long Lake shoreline have been protected forever. Long Lake, Fort Pond, Nagog Pond, a circle of familiarity for the Neshoba clan that once lived here. Protected open space for critters that came back or who still remain. And a chance for us today to explore a network of tracks through time. Definitely a special place for the spirit.